All right, welcome back to Super Cloud 3. This is the keynote conversation here back in Palo Alto, California. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE with David Flynn, CEO of Hammerspace, CUBE alumni, entrepreneur. Um, some big news launching here at SuperCloud. David, great to see you on theCUBE. Thanks for coming on. Good to see you too, thanks. So yeah. before we get started, I talk about SuperCloud 3, the dynamics of security, data, AI, all things going on. SuperCloud, powering the next generation apps. This next cycle's coming. Um, you guys got some big news with Hammerspace as the CEO. That's right. You got some scoop here, exclusive news. Exclusive news. We just announced a major funding round. 56 million in funding from an A-list uh, set of investors. So a tough market right now for funding. What were some of the things that were talked about? What was the validation? What was the key um, um, factor in, in closing this round? Yeah, the, the key here has to do with, you know, proof of the product market fit through the customer base. So the likes of Blue Origin, you know, Jeff Bezos own company, who's going to know cloud better than that? That uh, Blue Origin is using Hammerspace as their data plane for hybrid cloud. That's, that's a pretty big endorsement. And um, so, you know, it's really just seeing the momentum and especially how it's impacting the, the next data cycle. Uh, with AI, ML, uh, advanced analytics. You guys done a great job with SuperCloud before on our last event mm -hmm. uh, and been a big part of the community as it's been growing. There's been a big focus on things be below and below, below SuperCloud and above SuperCloud. So supercomputing, you're yeah. seeing a lot of advances at the physical layer, GPUs, and then above the SuperCloud layer, you're starting to see super apps emerge. So you yeah. get the super stack, I call it. Um, yeah. And it's all revolving around data. So whether you're talking about security, data meshes, or whatever, the role of data is key. And that has become the hottest topic because AI is data and all the value we're Absolutely. seeing with AI is from the data revolution that's going on again another inflection point on data. You call it the next data cycle. I the like, next data cycle. I like this term. Explain what you mean by this next data cycle. The next cycle. data cycle is really defined in, in how things have radically shifted. We went from a world with data warehouses, maybe cloud hosted data warehouses, highly structured data, a lot of painstaking maintenance of it, to a world now where unstructured data rules, the massive amounts of data that you have. And that's because with AI and ML, uh, you don't need it to be pre-structured for you. So a lot more value can be extracted from much larger quantities of data. We view this as just a, a new data cycle. It's the next data cycle. You know, David, we've known each other now for over a decade. You've been a great, <laughs> successful entrepreneur, multiple sex successes and exits. But you've been in the storage data game for a long time. In the time. data for a long time. So you've Absolutely. seen many cycles. Absolutely. This cycle, why is it different? Because, you know, you, again, storage, you store data, it goes from point A, it gets stored at point B. Now you have data in flight. Okay, you're seeing cloud, you're seeing AI. Where are we now? Tell us what, what you, well, how you see this, because this is unique time in history. That's right. We finally reached the tipping point where we have to move from a world where data is something that is stored, copied, and merged to a world where data simply exists and is orchestrated transparently. So moving from store, copy, merge to orchestrated is a radical change. And what it allows you to do is to have da data be present everywhere that you need it with high performance, local access, so you can feed it into AI training um, and inference, uh, but have it at any site that you need it at. Servers, storage, and networking never go away. They're just abstracted away as more functionality and complexity comes in. As storage goes into super mode, super cloud mode here, what has to change? You mentioned well, orchestration. Yeah. What's different and what has to be different well, going forward? The first forward? thing is that data is a platform thing. And yet data has been a mirage that is rendered by the infrastructure. And so infrastructure storage systems have uh, been the captors of data. So you have an inversion between platform and infrastructure. So with data orchestration, you finally have data that can transcend the infrastructure, is not, is not a captive to the infrastructure. What are some of the technologies involved in this? Because you're seeing this, everyone's getting behind this next wave. I think everyone now sees AI as kind of like the, it is the, the future path, they see AI. They can connect the dots, they can see the bridge that they have to cross. Absolutely. What are those technologies? Well, you know, obviously GPUs, you know, other specialized processing for, for being able to work with those large amounts of data. Um, the, uh, 
The, the unsung hero behind it, though, is the data platform and the ability to orchestrate the data uh, to where you have the GPU clusters, whether that's rented in the cloud or, or on-prem. So I think some of the key things are the GPUs, AI and ML, the, the, the models and such that we work with for training, and uh, the data orchestration piece for making the data. Explain what is the Hammerspace data orchestration product, solution, technology. What does it mean? What is it? What is it? Fundamentally, yeah. And define it and then talk about the benefits. So fundamentally, it's, it's two things. It's a file system that has finished the progression that file systems have been on to the, since the beginning. File systems used to be part of the OS and then they were put on the network as an appliance, network appliance, and then they were made to scale out. Now what we're talking about is a file system that can span everything. It can sit on top of any form of storage third-party storage, vendor neutral, and can span across whole data centers. So that first thing, some talk about that as a global namespace, right? But it's a high performance and it's a new class of file system. It's a, it's a true parallel file system that gives you the kind of scale. So that's the number one piece. And the second part is that that then allows you to take the data movement, where you place and move data can now be done behind the file system to where it can now be fully automated and is non-disruptive to the use. So data orchestration is what happens when you take data management uh, and put it behind the file system instead of out front. And give me an example of this in, in motion. I mean, in, I shouldn't say that in motion because data's in motion. Give me an example of this in, in action. In practice. In practice, a use case. Give an example. Yeah. In practice, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, Two key motivators, number one is to have a workforce that can be anywhere in the world and be able to interact with the data, and number two is to have the compute be anywhere in the world. Be able to take uh, data that's collected uh, at one site and be able to do uh, the ML training at another site, to have uh, researchers at other locations be able to work with it, and each of them be able to have local high performance access to that data from uh, different computing centers. You know, I love um, the AI world and the data analytics, how it's in a collision course, it has collided, it happened. It was almost the chat, chat GPT woke everyone up saying, wow, that's yeah. magic. And, but it really kind of educated the masses, which is great. Mm -hmm. What is the AI impact here? Because when you have data that's fundamental for AI, you have to have it available, okay. highly available, and highly available, have high availability and make it highly available, two different things. So you have the training and the inference of the two kind of knobs people are talking about that are costly right now. Well, and the key to that is that the old mantra of move the compute to your data, you know, because of data gravity and because data, a platform layer thing is a prisoner to storage, an infrastructure layer thing, that layering inversion. Because of that, the, the mantra was move the compute to the data. But that simply won't work anymore when you need tens of thousands of GPUs. When you want to do things in mass, you have to be able, I mean, data after all is the thing that's digital. Why would we be saying moving the compute to the data? The compute is what you have to have racked and stacked and powered and cooled <laughs> on massive scale. It's the thing that's tied to the physical world. The data's digital. Yeah. So we have to be able to orchestrate the data so that it, it can be at one point in time local to this location and at other points in time local to another. Okay, that goes against some of the things that I've been hearing over the years, like move the compute to the data, you mentioned that. Yeah, yeah. It's expensive to move data. What's the cost factor here? Is that a bottleneck, or is that a feature or a bug? What's, I mean, this is a, so, so a the big key, discussion. The key to that and the, and the magic part in data orchestration is a push-pull model to where data can be pushed through policy and can be pulled on demand. And key to both of those is that it's done granularly and non-disruptively. So you see a file system, you access files. It's that simple. But through policy, you can have the data pushed so that it's already local, you don't have to wait for it. But because it's behind the file system, you can also have pull, something goes to access it, it goes and grabs it. So you get the best of both worlds. And it boils down to the, by the way, it's the same design methodology that's used in Kubernetes, and that's to do automated orchestration of very fine grain, lightweight, encapsulated units. I was going to bring up Kubernetes, and it's funny that you brought that up because Kubernetes solves that orchestration problem in They're the orchestrating container, compute, exactly. in, the, in the cloud native, and that opened up a unification model for the cloud native surge, microservices, and Absolutely. essentially now that's rendering itself and shifting left, developers are in charge, 
So, so the parallels between you know orchestrating containerized microservices and orchestrating data uh, are, are are very powerful. One is you take the smallest, most granular unit, the microservice or the individual file, and the second is you have the lightest weight encapsulation, a, a container, <laughs> right, yeah. and it's orchestrated independently. And the same thing is true here: the ability to move data at the file granularity without disrupting the access. So very similar principles, whether you're orchestrating computer, or orchestrating. I data. want to get your reaction. I love this conversation because it's right in line with what we've been reporting and thinking. The the rise of super cloud. In, is the new IT is what I'm calling it. Mm -hmm. Because if the, the super cloud is IT, the developers are ultimately in charge because the Kubernetes has unleashed the productivity of developers. Right. Yeah, it caused some new concerns, software supply chains being addressed, okay? Um, now you got data going down that same path. I've been saying data developer. Is, okay. is the super cloud the new IT? So you could say so, because what it's really letting you do is to work at the platform layer and no longer have to care about the infrastructure layer, right? And that's, that's, what, that's how it empowers those folks, is they can self-service with, with orchestrated containerized microservices, with orchestrated you know, unstructured data at scale. Now you don't have to think about all of the logistics of the infrastructure. I was saying to Dave Vellante, we were riffing on this topic on, on, on our podcast, every Friday by the way, so check it out, um, is, IT guys are going to be in the guardrail business. You hear that term a lot. Set up the guardrails. Uh, in AI, you hear that. You know, set the set guardrails. Set up the playpen. Make yeah. a playpen. <laughs> yeah, get everyone set up. Bounce around the guardrails. Don't go off the track. Yeah. Mainly because of one fear, security fears, also sure. you know, AI and economy. That's just kind of how things are going. This guardrails is an operational impact. And so I can see data orchestration be part of super cloud. How does it connect to super cloud, in your opinion, as you go down this data? Uh, orchestration, next data cycle emerging. How does that intersect with super cloud? Well, the way I think of super cloud really is it's a software defined cloud, a cloud of clouds, you know, a, a cloud that's, I would say, as it was always intended to be, the ability to run anything anywhere without having to give a, a hoot about the, the infrastructure concerns. But you can't do that when data is subordinated to the storage infrastructure. So that data has to be something whose existence is now transcendent of the infrastructure. And that is what orchestration does, is it allows data to exist independent of any storage and outlive any storage because now it's your data is perpetually in motion. Simply through objective, you can swipe a mouse and the data is present wherever you need it. You can commission new infrastructure, you can decommission old infrastructure, move data to it, and all of that is done behind the scenes, behind the, the uh, file system. It's like a new abstraction layer, and I like this idea of mm -hmm. smart data management or intelligent data management, you, that's my word, you kind of saying that, but that's what, what orchestration is. It's really bringing this ability to scale horizontally, but yet yeah. give the vertical domain AI, the right data at the right time in the apps. Exactly, exactly. But I don't think people understand how radical a departure it is from what we know in the past. Give an example. Well, data management has always been uh, storage, store, copy, and merge, right? In one form or another, whether it's making backups or restoration of backups, whether it's replicating between sites, whatever, it's always been a function of, of store it, yeah. copy it, and merge it. And, and if you ask people if there's another way, there is no other way. It doesn't seem like there's another way other than that. But in an orchestrated environment, now the data moves behind the data presentation layer so you don't even see it when it moves. It, it, it allows data to, to be transcendent of it and have a continuous accessibility even while the data is pushed and pulled across, across different infrastructure. That's a great point. I want to ask you one more thing to add to that because I think that's a good description. You mentioned platforms earlier. When you're in an orchestration model, you got to have an enabling, enabling benefit um, mm -hmm. versus say a siloed benefit, which is an operational construct. Okay, a siloed database, yeah, yeah. store stuff, call the guy, gal, get some data, merge it, whatever. When you're talking about a platform, that's enablement. You got to have an enablement, enabling benefit. Well, I'd say one of the most uh, profound things that this enables is it enables a new form of collaboration between companies whose products are data. More and more data is the product, right? Yeah. And 
it too has a supply chain and that typically has been again store copy and merge but in a world where you have data orchestration you can literally share the same global file system and vendor a and their you know their contract vendors are all simply working from within the same file system having the data present in their own infrastructure serving their high performance applications but with it being the same data. I was on Threads, which is the new Facebook meta app that's competing against Twitter, and I, I made a comment, um, you'll appreciate this. I said, hey everyone, all the IG young, young guns out there, I'm the old guy, I've been around many cycles, and I said, how many cycles have you been in? And then everyone goes, what's a cycle? Uh, meaning the cycle in the industry, and I think, right. you know, Dave Vellante calls it waves of innovation, or waves, inflection yeah. points. Um, this next data cycle is an interesting concept because it does highlight how to think differently around what's coming next and what you have now. Yeah. How does Hammerspace see that evolving for customers? Because I think that's a key super cloud enabler. If you do it right, you get benefits. If you do it wrong, you don't. Yeah, I, I think in the next data cycle, um, it's a big shift from you know, small amounts of structured data to the entirety of people's data needing to be kept online. So forget active archival, it's everything there, right? And, uh, and the need to have that in different locations so that you can do training, so that you can do inference. Uh, and and uh, so it, it will be a radical departure from what we know of uh, for those reasons. And you know, this video is actually data. We're going to convert it into the cloud. It'll do generative AI, get the clips. Uh, we also will pump it into our large, our small language model, I guess, compared to the other ones. <laughs> but we get the data. Everything will be fundamentally digitized. It's data. Every company's impacted by this next wave. And notice how little cycle. you have to think about the structure of it. Because the structure is, is understood now by the AI side of it. So you got a big wave. It's a big inflection point. Probably bigger than anything that we've seen. At least I've been saying publicly that I've never seen anything this massive and this in, impactful generationally. Um, going back to the PC days when I was younger, seeing, well, that's a complete platform shift from the way things were before. Um, certainly that was a cycle and that was a major inflection point. And then the web, now this, I would even consider social media smaller compared to this wave coming with AI. Oh, absolutely. How are you guys looking at this? You got great yep. investors, you got 56 million in cash. How are you going to use the funds? What's your plan? What's your strategy? Yeah, first, we are super excited about, about the investors being led uh, by Prosperity7. That's uh, um, actually uh, a uh, evergreen fund from Saudi Aramco. Uh, very innovative, especially in the AI space. And then uh, Kathy Wood uh, with ARC Investments. Uh, you know, the thing that's common about all of these is, is their belief in the technical founder CEO, which, which you know, fit, fits me well. Um, <laughs> You've done all, well with that. But, you know, also that they uh, invest in companies that are disruptive innovators, that stand to disrupt the status quo. And in this case, how data has been traditionally stored and managed. Um, but, you know, that, then also the thing that I'd like is that they are all long-term shareholders. Kathy is mainly playing in the public markets. So this is her crossover fund, uh, her interval fund. And so, you know, the same is true with our other investors like Peer 88 and, and so forth. So every single one of these investors are not the traditional venture capitalists who have to distribute to their LPs as soon as a company- So they're in the public. long game here. They're in the long game and that's because we are, you know, getting to an IPO for us is really just getting to the starting gate, right? And we don't want to have to worry about shareholder turnover. So raising 56 million from these very long-term investors uh, that's that's very exciting for us. And you've been there, done that with the IPO record, track record, another yep. a race around the track, as they say, another cycle for David Flynn. We saw that you with know? Fusion IO, but this 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 one is even more impactful. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's because I don't think people understand the the uh, impact that moving from uh, traditional storage copy and merge yeah. to a world where data is is orchestrated. The TAM here is trillions. I mean, it's not even, it's so much small, I mean, bigger than, than the, the Fusion IO space, which was a large market That's there. Right. That was still massive. This is like, like every company. And you, you'll remember how solid state was new when we introduced Fusion IO and people didn't really understand what you were going to do with that kind of yeah. performance horsepower and so forth. Well, the same is true here. If, if we're successful, then people are going to look back in five years yeah. 
and they're going to, 10 years maybe, it shouldn't take us that long. <laughs> and they're going to go, how on earth did we survive in a day when you had to do manual janitorial work to shuffle data off between these yeah. storage systems? I mean, with the acceleration of value we were seeing with AI, I, it could be five years, I would say 10 to 15, maybe on other cycles, but this next data cycle is going to be highly accelerated because the value, time to value, will be faster if done right. So I think there's going to yeah. be a lot of kind of broken down cars on the side of the road. You're going to see people speeding through the freeway. You know, you're yeah, going to yeah. start to see the winners. I mean, it's going to be very yeah. clear. Yeah. And, and the beauty about data orchestration is that for the first time you can actually use AI to do the pushing of data to where you're going to need it in advance. So you can use AI to be predictive about how data gets placed and uh, moved across a complex infrastructure environment where you have computing assets in many different locations. I think people are not repivoting their business around data, they're going to be extinct. David Flint, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thank you Congratulations so much. on breaking the news here on SuperCloud 3. Thanks for helping us. SuperCloud 3 keynote conversation with David Flint, the CEO of Hammerspace. Um, big player in SuperCloud market, enabling the apps and increasing the performance, of course. Breaking news here on theCUBE, I'm John Furrier. We'll be right back with more SuperCloud 3 after this short break. <laughs>